the prophecies of the Old Testament respecting Messiah, considered and proved to be literally fulfilled in Jesus, containing an answer to the objections of the author of The Scheme of Literal Prophecy by Dr John Gill, narrated by David Clark. The design of the following sheet is to consider the prophecies of the Old Testament respecting the Messiah and to prove that they are literally fulfilled in Jesus against both Jews and Deists. I have therefore collected together the exceptions of the former of those prophecies and the rather because they are as far as known made use of by the latter. I have consulted as much as I was able the writings of both old and latter Jews and shown that in most, if not in all, the prophecies considered they have understood them of the Messiah. I produce those authorities not as decisive in this controversy but as the convictions and concessions of an adversary and that a bitter and applicable one to Christianity and which I think deserves consideration with the deists. I cite old Jews to show the sense of the ancient synagogue, and the latter ones to show the strength of conviction upon their minds, who cannot but have observed what use the Christians have made of these prophecies, and though often pinched with them, yet they have been obliged to own them as prophecies of the Messiah, for which reason the testimonies of latter Jews seem to have the most strength and force in them, and that the reader may not be at a loss about the old Jews and latter Jews. He is desired to observe that by old Jews I mean those who wrote or are supposed to have written within the last five or six centuries after Christ, as the authors of the Targums, Talmud, Robath, Zohar, and by latter Jews, I mean those who wrote within the last five or six centuries, Mahamedes, Jaraki, Ben Ezra, Chimchi. The author of the scheme of literal prophecy, whose exceptions I have all long considered, has advanced several things with regard to the belief of the Jews concerning a Messiah, which I think myself obliged to take notice of in this place. First, he seems to insinuate as though the belief of a Messiah among the Jews was not anciently a fundamental article of their faith, but made so from the 11th century, when their confession of faith was drawn up by our Moses Mahomedes, that the Jews' confession of faith was drawn up by Mahomedes about that time in the 13th article is not denied, which articles are generally believed by all of them without any contradiction as Leo Modena says. But then, this no more proves that the article relating to the Messiah then began to be the fundamental article of their faith than the articles respecting the unity of the divine being, which must be acknowledged was always the faith of the Jewish church. Besides, Maimedes did not make but only draw up these articles, and it is highly reasonable to suppose that he drew them up not as the novel opinions of some particular persons, but as what had been the ancient consent and universal sense of these people, and what would be received as such without hesitation, as they accordingly were. Our Joseph Albo is the only person that is usually cited as denying the article of the Messiah to be a fundamental one. He reduced the Jews' confession of faith to three general heads, which he calls roots, namely the belief of the divine being, the law of Moses, and a state of rewards and punishments, to which he thought all the rest reducible. Now, though he is not willing to allow the article of the Messiah to be a root or a fundamental principle, his design herein being manifestly enough to oppose the Christian religion, whose main fundamental principle is faith in the Messiah, Jesus, I say, though he is not willing to allow it to be a root, yet he grants that it is a branch which arises from the third root, that is, that of rewards and punishment, and declares that all ought to believe the Messiah, who received the law of Moses, 
that the prophets prophesied of his coming, which is sure and evident that he who does not believe the coming of Messiah denies the words of the prophets and is a transgressor of the affirmative precepts, so that though he will not allow the article of the Messiah to be a fundamental one in which he was alone and had no followers, yet he owns it to be a branch of a fundamental one, and therefore we should not be so far from concluding from the single opinion of this person that this was not a fundamental article of the Jewish faith and that the contrary is rather evident from hence. Secondly, the same author intimates that many of the Jews themselves seem to have no expectation of a Messiah as the Sadducees and scribes, the Samaritan Jews, Josephus, and some of his time, Arheliel, in the third century. Nay, that Mohammedes speaks very indifferently of it, and to the Sadducees they are impatiently expected the Messiah as the rest of the Jews did were as intent upon rejecting of Jesus, whom they supposed not to be the true Messiah, and were as violent opposers of him as his followers as any others, which they would not have concerning themselves about had they not believed in a Messiah. Some say that Karaites are of the old stock of the Sadducees and held to the same doctrine as they did, who it is certain except a Messiah as much as the other Jews did, as the scribes, who though they were, as this author says, letter men, yet believed that Christ, or the Messiah, is the son of David, and that Elias must come first. Indeed, he says that what he said of the Sadducees and scribes, he only proposes in the way of conjecture, but it seems to be a conjecture without any foundation for it. As to the Samaritan Jews, nothing is more manifest than that in the times of Jesus they expected a Messiah. It was a notion which seemed universally to obtain among them as appears from the woman of Samaria, with whom Jesus conversed, who could say, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. It is allowed that the modern ones have notions of a Messiah though very confused and very indifferent, which need not be wondered at, since they reject the books of the prophets and confine themselves to the five books of Moses. In one of their letters to Seliger, they say the name of the Messiah with them is a Greek word, an Hebrew word, which seems they do not know the signification of. It seems to be an abbreviation of an Hebrew word, and Greek word, he that is to come, whereby the Samaritans as well as the Jerusalem Jews understood the Messiah as is manifest from the words of the woman just now mentioned. As to Josephus and some other Jews in his time who thought that Vespasian was the prince that was to come, it is manifest enough that they expected a Messiah, though they were mistaken in the person whom they thought to be he nor can anything else be fairly concluded from hence. Our Haliel, it is true, gave out that Israel was to have no Messiah because they enjoyed him in the days of Hezekiah. But then this was only the opinion of a single person, for notwithstanding his authority, the Jews still expect a Messiah. Besides, this saying of his was not a disbelief of the Messiah, but a mistaken notion about the time of his coming and as of Mohammedes speaking indifferently of Messiah. It need not be wondered at in him, nor in any other of his nation, if there has been no other who had done so, since they have been so wretchedly disappointed in their expectation of him, and since they do so, little need of, and expect so little from him. Thirdly, this same author would have us believe that the expectation of Messiah among the Jews was grounded not upon the literal, but upon the allegorical and traditional sense of the scriptures. But if so, how come the scribes, who, as this author acknowledges, were a party of letter men to expect a Messiah and to say that he was the son of David, as has been observed before? Surely those men who are 
supposed to have rejected many of the prevailing Jewish notions not founded on the letter of the scriptures, would have rejected the notion of Messiah if not founded thereon. Besides, the Karaites or scriptorians, an ancient sect amongst the Jews, rejected the mystical, enigmatical tradition and allegorical expositions of the rabbis, strictly and closely adhered to the very letter of the scriptures, and yet expected a Messiah as much as other Jews do. Now from thence could this exception arise, or wherein could it be grounded, but the literal sense of the scriptures. It is therefore a mistake that a notion of a Messiah cannot be established from the prophecies of the Old Testament without a mystical and allegorical sense of them, for in their first literal and obvious sense they respect him, as I hope the following account of them will make appear. Fourthly, I cannot but much wonder that this author should think, most probable as many of the places wherein the Messiah is expressly named in the Chaldee paraphrases are interpolations, especially when he thinks that those writings are much more modern and of the latter date than the Jews would have them be. For the latter, the date of them is, the less reason is there to suppose them to be interpolated in those passages which respect the Messiah. For surely it can never be thought that they would take such a method with their own targums on those prophecies when they must suppose to know what use the Christians made of them, both against them and in the vindication of Christianity. Nor is there anything with which the Jews are more puzzled and confounded than when they argue with these paraphrases, as there is a great deal of reason to suppose that those places wherein the Messiah is expressed, named, are far from being interpolations, that were not those writings so sacred with them as that they dare not corrupt them. They would have expunged them long ago as to this author's reasons for their thoughts that Josephus says, these Jews who were in the vulgar era or the belief of a Messiah to arise out of their nation built their expectations but on one ambiguous oracle or prophecy found in their sacred books. I would only reply that Josephus indeed speaks of an oracle or prophecy found in their sacred books, that about that time one of them from their own country should rule over the world, which oracle he used he calls an ambiguous one and says what chiefly excited the Jews to the war. But then he nowhere says that the Jews' expectation of a Messiah was built upon one single doubtful prophecy, but that their expectation of his arising out of their country and at that time was so. The ambiguity of which oracle lay in his arising out of their nation, which some understood to be of his being born there, as the generality of the Jews did and others, and his entering upon his government there, as Josephus did, and therefore applies it to Vespasian. For whence it appears that this instance gives no reason to conclude that the passage of respect to the Messiah in the Chaldee paraphrases are interpolations, for the Jews might have many plain prophecies on which they built their expectation of a Messiah, some of which whose paraphrases have pointed out to us. And yet Josephus speaks about one ambiguous or doubtful prophecy respecting the time of his coming and the country from whence he was to arise, which excited the Jews to the war and animated them obstinately to persist therein, in which he supposes them to be mistaken though. Alas, the ground of their mistake and which therefore was fatal to them was that the Messiah, the person prophesied of, was already come. To conclude, with desiring the reader to observe that I do not produce the prophecies of the Old Testament respecting the Messiah's second coming as literally fulfilled in Jesus, but as to be fulfilled in him, and the reason of my taking notice of them 
is to make the scheme of prophecy more complete and seeing all the rest of the prophecies respecting the Messiah have had a literal completion in, in Jesus. There is a great deal of reason to believe that these will also, especially seeing it as such a completion of them, that Jesus and his apostles have given us reason to expect. I have not, indeed, inquired into the authenticity of the book of Daniel or of the first chapters of St. Matthew's Gospel, which the author of the scheme of literal prophecy has called into question, but have taken them from genuine parts of the sacred writings. The reason why I have not attempted to inquire into this nature when I have had occasion to consider some passages in those parts of the scripture is because I was not willing to interrupt the reader by breaking the thread of the prophecy. I must confess that what this author has advanced on this head deserves consideration and I hope that some of the learned writers in this controversy will think it worth their notice and regard. I shall only add that whereas my design in writing the following sheet is an honest and impartial inquiry after truth and an attempt to establish and promote it, in doing of which, as I have treated the arguments with candour and temper, so, I hope, if I should appear to be mistaken in anything I have advanced, I shall be candidly treated, as I shall be heartily thankful for such a discovery.